Hi, everybody, and welcome to the next unit. Um, we're going to be talking about the Reformation in this unit. Um, and so you can see here how it corresponds to standard number WH3. Um, we're going to talk about the Reformation, explain the effects of the theological, political, and economic differences that emerged, and the views of Martin Luther, John Calvin, Henry VIII, we're going to describe uh, the impact of the religious conflicts. We're also going to talk about the Inquisition, what that was, and how those things affected society. And we're also going to talk about how it affected the government uh, or kings at that time who really were the government. And then we're also going to talk about the changing cultural values, traditions, philosophies, and the, and the ideas. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to assess the role of the printing press. And we're going to do that a little bit now, but more so after we look at the age of exploration with another DBQ, because I know that's exciting. Okay. So uh, you guys see all that. That's on page 27 of your notes. That's the SOL outline. But what I want to talk about today on page 29 in your notes are the causes of the Reformation. Hopefully I'm going to keep this a nice short uh, video for you guys. Uh, just to make sure that nothing is too terribly long. Uh, so anyway, so the Reformation, what was it first? The Reformation was a change in philosophy. A Reformation, or the Reformation, was a changing from a uh, majority of Europeans being Catholic and being members of the Catholic Church or Christian Catholic Church to reforming that church and the breaking off of a lot of different churches. So the Reformation was a time period uh, that began with Martin Luther, and it marked a significant change in the way people practice their religion. And it marked a significant shift in power away from the Catholic Church. So there's a Reformation. So what caused this change? Well, number one, there were some major changes in society. Um, as we talked about in the Renaissance, people began focusing more on the individual artistically. Uh, people get, began focusing more, or artists did, on life in the here and the now. And so that was one of the <clears throat> major changes. Well, leading up to that, just like we talked about with the Renaissance, uh, other people, people other than kings, were starting to gain wealth. Um, and so as they were getting wealth, um, they wanted to do things with that wealth, and they wanted to make more money uh, with their own wealth. Well, what was happening, especially in Italy and, and in a lot of other places, is merchants were getting more money than nobility. And so the nobility would often have to borrow money borrowing money or rather loaning money to someone else and charging interest rates for that is called usury. And so merchants wanted to loan people money. Um, well, the problem with that was that it was actually considered a sin at the time for banks to exist and to loan money uh, to people for a profit. The only people who could do that in Europe were Jewish people because um, the Jewish faith does not or did not outlaw usury. Uh, and the loaning of money to people for for a profit. And so the Catholic Church uh, was saying, mm, this might be a, something we might want to change. And because merchants were getting wealthy, they wanted to loan and make their own money. And um, they were noticing that more and more people were relying on Jewish people uh, to, to borrow money. And it also led to a really negative stigma on Jewish people as wanting to keep wealth and keep money. Okay, so changes in society, merchants became more wealthy, and usury became a more socially accepted practice. Uh, the Catholic Church also um, began being questioned. Uh, the power of the church, as we saw, uh, Copernicus said, wait a minute, the earth doesn't revolve around the sun, or the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. Um, well, the earth revolves around the sun. There were lots of other questions of the church as well. The idea of what's called Christian humanism, as we talked about Erasmus, the Christian humanist. Um, Christian humanism basically states that you can still be a Christian, but you can believe it in the ultimate ability of us as humans uh, to do things in our own, our own ability and our own strength. And uh, people began, there, a new philosophy began to emerge called the philosophy of Christ. And basically, this is that everyday people should attempt to live life as Christ would. It's kind of like the WWJD. What would Jesus do? Um, idea that we have now is that um, you should your life should try to imitate Christ. Well, another question of the church was that the Italians had dominated the Catholic Church for centuries. Um, it was almost entirely the the papacy was almost entirely made up of. The Italians are very rarely went to other people. And some people started to question that. Well, along with questioning the church, um, the church had grown extremely wealthy. 
and extremely powerful politically. During the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church was the number one political entity in Europe. And basically what that means is this, is that the Catholic Church, if they wanted something done, they would tell the kings, hey, I need you to do this, or I need you to do whatever. Okay, And the kings in France, in Germany, in England, were supposed to do what the Catholic Church told them, what the Pope said. So that took a lot of power away from kings. And they kind of resented that. Well, along with that, the church owned a lot of land. In fact, that's what made them very powerful is the Catholic Church owned a lot of land in Europe. Now, and kings are seeing this. And if the church owns land, you can't tax the church because if you are a government entity or a government um, taxing the church, that puts you in a place above that church. And so the Catholic Church is like, no, you're not going to tax us. But the kings are like, well, you've got a lot of money that we don't have. Well, not only were people questioning that, people were questioning what the church was doing with that wealth and political power. Uh, one of the popes in the 1400s, 1500s, was a guy named Julius II. And Julius II was seen as the warrior pope because Julius II actually waged war and guided and directed troops and told these troops, hey, we're going to gain more land for the Vatican. An area of Italy known as the Papal States began to emerge. Italy on the Italian peninsula was not one country like we think of it today. Um, Italy was a series or a collection of small city-states that operated pretty much independently. Well, Julius wanted to unify a lot of them, and he did by waging war. Well, Julius is also responsible for um, the commissioning or the building of St. Peter's Basilica. He's also responsible for getting Michelangelo to, to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. None of that was cheap. All of that took a lot of money. And so what that means is the church has to have a lot of money to raise all this okay, and do this. And people are seeing, hey, why is the church spending money on this stuff that doesn't really help anybody get to heaven? Uh, it's not really about being pious or holy. It's just about showing how much wealth you have. And so people began to question that. Well, along with that, along with that um, the church was being corrupt. Uh, members of the church uh, were very corrupt. Uh, popes were often corrupt. Popes had children illegitimately. Often popes had children before they became the pope, um, which Catholic priests were not supposed to marry and still are not supposed to marry and have children. Um, and something called indulgences were being sold. And I'll talk about the sale of indulgences in just a second. Well, first of all, on the local level, um, each town was ba is basically called a parish, okay? And each parish had its own church. The person that you were in the most contact with as a European um, was your local parish priest. That was your local priest. Well, a lot of the times, those parish priests were not any more educated than the average Joe. And what that meant was that they couldn't read. Oftentimes, that meant that they... Um, were not actually reading the Bible or interpreting the Bible. They were just reciting what they had been told to recite. Here's the problem with that, or another problem. The parish priests were also married. Like I said earlier, a lot of times they would have uh, mistresses and have children. And so people saw that and did not think that was the correct way um, since they were being told that here's what priests were supposed to do. They did not believe that that was correct. Well, the parish priests were corrupt in that way. They were also corrupt in that they were uneducated um, often. And a lot of times, if you were wealthy or a king and you wanted to buy a position for your son, not just kings, but local smaller nobility, uh, a position for your lower son because you didn't, he didn't get all, the, all your lands, you would buy him a priesthood. And he could continue doing on whatever it was that he was doing as a priest. Well, the church was also selling indulgences. Now, an adult, indulgence is a pardon from sin. Basically, the way I want you to look out of it look at it is it's not necessarily a get out of hell free card, but it's a slip of paper that limits your time in a place called purgatory. Purgatory, um, according to Catholic doctrine at the time, was kind of a the waiting room before you went to heaven. Okay, And the more sins you had in this world, the longer you're spent in purgatory. Well, um, an indulgence shortened your time in purgatory. An indulgence was basically like buying your way into heaven and shortening your time in that waiting room. Well, an indulgence used to be given for doing good things, doing good, helping the poor, helping the needy. Well, there was a guy named Johann Tetzel who was going around Germany selling indulgences. 
Okay, so he would go to the wealthy and he would take these indulgences and actually sell them to people. And the cost for an indulgence or this get out of hell free card or shorten your time in purgatory card was about three marks. Now, it would, that is basically half a year's salary for a person. So I want you to think about who is able to buy the indulgences and why that is right and why that is wrong. So essentially, you could buy your own salvation. You can do whatever you want and just buy your way out of it by buying this indulgence. And again, indulgence is a sheet of paper basically from the Catholic Church that said, hey, you're good to go. Um, you don't have to spend time in purgatory. And the last uh, cause of the Reformation where there were some early reformers of the Catholic Church who questioned the Catholic Church. The first one is an Englishman named John Wycliffe. And John Wycliffe lived, as you can see there, 1331 to 1384. Now, this is long before, uh, this is like right at the beginning of the Renaissance um, and much before the Reformation. The important idea here is that Wycliffe believed that we should be able to, to interpret the Bible on our own, and that's an important thing. And he also inter uh, translated the Bible into vernacular English, so the language that people spoke in England at the time. He said it was up to the individual, that's a Renaissance idea, to determine his own faith, and that's really important. But his ideas didn't spread very far, and we'll explain why later. A second influential leader or character in the um, Reformation, leading up to the Reformation, was a guy named Jan Hus. Jan Hus lived, obviously, much later. His life coincided, but Jan Hus was in Hungar Hungary. Okay, and Jan Hus was also another member of the Catholic Church who said, who saw all of the corruption of the Catholic Church and all the problems and said, um, this isn't right. Um, and he began to criticize the church and he said that the individual was the one who led their own salvation and you did not have to rely on the church itself um, to gain your salvation. He was actually excommunicated and burned at the stake uh, for his heresy or speaking out against the Catholic Church. Okay, so that real quick are uh, five causes of the Reformation, and we'll spend a little bit um, more time talking about that in class, uh, but watch this over the weekend. I hope you had a great day. Bye-bye.